Good afternoon. Um, so today we are going to continue with uh, learning unit one. And uh, on learning, learning unit one, we're done learning unit 1.1 and uh, 1.2. So today we're going to be looking at uh, section 1.3 of uh, learning unit one. So we're going to be looking at section 1.3 of learning unit one. So just to do a quick recap, when we look at learning unit one, we are looking at the relationship between risk and return. And in the previous section, we have looked to see exactly how do you calculate the risk and return of a single asset. Then we also looked to see how do you calculate the risk and return of a portfolio of two assets as well. So we look at calculating the risk and return of, uh, of a single asset. And then we also look at the calcul calculating the risk and return of um, a portfolio of two assets as well. So today, we are now going to be looking at section 1.3 where we look at the capital asset price model as the measure of uh, return. So we also look at the capital asset price model as a measure of return. And under that section, they say a common procedure is to use historical data and regression analysis to determine a best fit linear relationship between return from an investment and returns from the market portfolio. So this relationship has the form of which given as R, where R is the return from investment and RM is the return from the market portfolio and A and B are constants and E is the random variable, which is equal to the regression error as well. So based on equation 1.3, they say equation 1.3 shows that there are two uncertain components to the risk in the investment return. The first one, a, the, the, the say a component B beta multiplied by the market return, which is a multiple of the return from the market portfolio. And the second component is where they say a component E, which is an unrelated, which is unrelated to the return from the market portfolio, which is basically the error term. So these are the two variables which are resulting in what uh, uncertainties in the components as well. So the reason why the constant error term A is basically not uncertain because you see later on when you look at the capital asset pricing model, the, the constant value of A is basically the risk rate of return, which means that you know with certainty how much you're going to be able to get when you look at what? When you're investing in a particular asset as well. So we know in, in with certainty what the risk rate of return would be. But what you don't know with certainty is this component, and what you don't know with certainty is this component as well. So here they say the first component is referred to as the systematic risk. The second component is referred to as the non-systematic risk. So when you look at, the, look at the systematic risk, this is the risk that we, we said that uh, look is basically sometimes referred to as the non-diversifiable risk. So it takes into account non-diversifiable risk. And the second component also takes into account what? The diversifiable risk. So here they say, consider first that uh, the non-systematic risk. If we assume that the E variables for different investments are independent of each other, the non-systematic risk is almost completely diversified away in a large portfolio. So an investor should not therefore be concerned about non-systematic risk and should not require an extra return above the risk-free rate for bearing non-systematic risk. So here, when they talk about the non-systematic risk, which is basically this error component, they are basically saying, we know that when you look at the relationship between systematic risk and non-systematic risk, we can present it as something like this. Where we say your total risk is represented as something like this. Where we say this component so this component 
is your, so you look at the total risk and the number of securities. So we're assuming that these are different securities. So we are saying that this component is your diversifiable risk. So this is where your diversifiable or non-systematic uh, and systematic risk or non-systematic risk. And this component, which remains constant, no matter how many securities you have, this component which remains constant is what we are referring to as systematic. Usually we refer to this as unsystematic risk. And this becomes non-diversifiable risk. So we are saying under normal circumstances, when you have your investment portfolio, we are expecting that this diversifiable risk is going to be overly reduced, which is the second component, which is the error term. We're expecting it to overly reduce to such a situation where the only risk that we're going to be left with in our portfolio is the systematic risk. So if we are fully diversified by having different securities, we're expecting that our total risk is only going to be left with systematic risk. And this systematic risk is the risk which is measured by, by the beta. So under normal circumstances, we assume that your portfolio is fully diversified to such an extent that the only risk you're left with is the systematic risk, which is measured by, which is measured by beta. So this is what we also assume when it comes to the capital asset pricing model. So when it comes to the capital asset pricing model, which is the formula that we're going to be looking at later on, you will see that the assumption is that we have done away with this risk and the only risk we're going to be left with is going to be the systematic risk. Are we on the same page? Any questions? So that's why they say the systematic risk component is what should matter to an investor. So the investor, so we're saying that under normal circumstances, the investor should be fully diversified to such an extent where the diversifiable risk is zero, which means that the only risk that they're going to be left with worrying about would be the systematic risk. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anyone lost? So that's what the capital asset price model assumes. Because if you look at the formula for the capital asset price model, we say the expected return is given as the risk rate of return plus beta in brackets, market return minus risk rate of return. So when you look at this component, we are basically assuming that the only relevant risk in this case is the systematic risk because we're assuming that your portfolio is fully diversified and the and the uh, um the unsystematic risk has been done away with through diversification so this is the capital asset price model are we on the same page are we on the same page any questions so the capital asset pricing model. So the capital asset pricing model says your expected return is given as your risk rate of return plus beta, market return minus risk free rate of return. That's what the capital asset pricing model says. So they, when you look at the, the relationship between risk and return, but basically saying that the only risk we're going to be worrying about there is the, is the systematic risk. 
So the only risk we're worrying about is the systematic risk, which means as a diagram, so which also means as a diagram, when you now put it diagrammatically, or when you plot the capital asset pricing model diagrammatically, we are also saying that um, looking at this relationship, the risk rate of return is that return that you're earning without incurring any risk at all. So remember the, the when you now draw this diagram, which shows us the capital, um, capital market, uh, um, security market line, we're saying the expected return, so the expected return, where we're plotting the expected return against the risk, and the risk here that we're worrying about is beta. So the capital market line basically says, when you look at the relation between risk and return, we're basically saying that the risk of return is that return that you're incurring without getting so this is the return that you're earning without incurring any risk. Then we also have the market return. So the market return is basically the return in the market. Sometimes they refer to it as the return on a particular index. So if they say the return on an index or the return in the market, they're talking about what? The market return. And also when they talk about the risk of return, this can be the return on a government security. Like for example, the return on treasury bills. So if they say the return on treasury bills, they're talking about the risk of return because on treasury bills, you're assuming that you're earning, a, if you invest in treasury bills, you're earning a return without incurring any risk at all because there are so many ways that the government can come up with to pay you back your money that you've invested in treasury bills. They can print money or they can raise taxes. That way, they are able to raise money to pay back whatever they own. Now, when you look at the market return, the market return would plot somewhere here. So this is where you find your market return. So your market return would plot somewhere here. And the corresponding risk, please take note, when you look at the market return, you always assume that for a return that you earn in the market, your relevant risk is basically the beta, and the beta is always assumed to be equal to one. So for a market return that you earn, always remember that the assumed amount or the relevant measure of beta for a market return would be equal to would be equal to one. So which means based on this information, the, the security market line, the security market line shows you that relationship which shows you the relationship which says your expected return is given as the risk of return plus beta market return minus risk-free rate of return. So which means for a particular market return, you're also going to be exposed to it an amount of beta. How much the amount of beta is going to be, we don't know, because it will depend on the information that you're keeping. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Any questions so far? So based on this formula, if you check in the textbook, uh, based on this formula, so if you check in the textbook based on this formula, they give us this information. They give us this information and they give us an example uh, and they say, suppose the risk rate of return is 5%. The return on the market portfolio is 10%. An investment with a beta of zero should have an expected return of 5%. So if the investment is a beta of zero, should have an expected return of 5% because we're saying, based on that information that is given, based on the information that is given, it would mean if the beta is equal to zero, it would mean your expected return would be equal to the result of return which is given as five, the beta of zero multiplied by 5% 
the market return, which is given as 10, minus the beta, minus the result of return of zero, or five, sorry. So this part gives you zero. So expected return would be equal to 5%. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anyone lost? Now, they also go on to give us uh, some information and say, this is because all of the risk in the investment can be diversified away. An investment with a beta of 0 0.5 should have an expected return, which is given as 0 0.05, which is the 5%. The beta of 0 0.5 multiplied by in brackets, market return of 10% as a decimal, which is 0 0.1, minus the risk of return of 0 0.05. So it will give you 0 0.075. And if you multiply that by 100, it gives you an expected return of 7.5%. Are we on the same page or now we're getting the 7.5%? Any questions? And at the same time, if an investment is a beta of 1.2, it would mean your expected return would be your risk rate of return of 0 0.05 plus the beta of 1.2 multiplied by in brackets, your market return, which is 10% as the decimal is 0 0.1 minus the risk rate of return of 0 0.05. So it means your expected return will be 0 0.11, which is equal to 11%. Are we together there? Now, please take note. They also give us in the same, the parameter beta is equal to the correlation coefficient of the asset in the market multiplied by the beta, by the standard deviation of the asset divided by the standard deviation of the market. So this will give us the value of, of beta. So where this is coming from, we are saying So we are saying there is a variation of how we can be able to get this beta. So there's a variation of how we can be able to get this beta. So taking note of the value of this beta, we can also say the beta is given as the systematic risk of the asset divided by the market risk. So it can be the systematic risk of the asset divided by the market risk. This is also the same as saying your covariance between the asset and the market divided by the variance of the market. So it will be the same as saying the covariance between the asset and the market divided by the variance of the market. And this is the same as saying, and this is the same as saying the correlation coefficient between the asset and the market multiplied by the standard deviation of the asset multiplied by the standard deviation of the market divided by the standard deviation squared of the market, which is the variance. So this is the same as saying. So the beta can also be given as the correlation coefficient between the asset and the market multiplied by the standard deviation of the asset multiplied by the standard deviation of the market divided by the standard deviation squared of the market. So what does that mean? If you break down this formula, this standard deviation of the market squared 
is the same as saying, so this is the same as saying, so this is the same as saying, remember the correlation coefficient can also be given as something like this. So it can be given as your correlation of the asset and the market. So it's the same as saying the correlation of the asset and the market, so which means in this case, this is the same as saying the correlation of the asset in the market multiplied by the standard deviation of the asset multiplied by the standard deviation of the market divided by the standard deviation of the market spread is the same as saying the standard deviation of the market multiplied by the standard deviation of the market. So the standard deviation of the market spread, which gives you the variance, is the same as saying the standard deviation of the market multiplied by the standard deviation of the market. Now, if you look at this mathematically, it would mean the numerator here, the denominator here can cancel out the numerator there. So the denominator here can cancel out the numerator there, which means that this formula can also be given as the correlation coefficient of the asset in the market times the standard deviation of the asset divided by the standard deviation of the market, which is exactly what they give you in the textbook there. So please understand this breakdown because sometimes they can try to confuse you in the exam and give you different variation of the information depending on exactly what they decide to give you there. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anyone lost? So this is what they're trying to explain on page 10. So this is the, so that breakdown, the reason why I'm giving you this breakdown is for you to be able to understand that depending on exactly what information they give you in the exam, you should be able to know how to calculate the beta in case it's not given as well. So which means based on this, they also say the parameter B is equal to the correlation coefficient of the asset in the market divided by the standard deviation which is the standard deviation of the asset divided by the standard deviation of the market, where this is the correlation between the return on the investment and the return on the market portfolio. And this is the standard deviation of the return on the investment. And this is the standard deviation of the return on what? Market portfolio. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anyone lost? So based on this, we now look at the assumptions. So we now look at the assumptions. So when you look at the risk and return assumptions, here they say the reasons why analysis, analysis leads to conclusion that do not correspond with the realities of markets is that in, present, uh, in presenting the arguments, we implicitly made a number of assumptions. So when you look at the when we presented the argument between risk and return, there were a couple of assumptions that were uh, that were made as well. Please take note of this because they can potentially bring this as what potential theory questions as well. So the first assumption that they give here is that they say we assume that investors are only about the k only about the expected return and the standard deviation of the return of their portfolio. So they we assume that investors only care about the expected return and the standard deviation uh, of the returns of the portfolio. So please take note of that. The second assumption was we assumed that the error variable for different investments in equation 1.3 are independent. And the, second, the third assumption is that we assume that investors focus on returns over just one period and that the length of this period is the same for all investors. So we assume that investors basically are assessing their investments over at the same time investment horizon. Then the fourth one, they say, we assume that investors can borrow and lend at the same risk-free rate. So this is approximately true in normal market conditions, 
for a large financial institution that is a good credit rating, but it is not exactly true for such financial institutions and not all, not at all true for small investors. And we also assume that we did not consider tax. So we did not consider our tax at all in the assumptions that we used or in the calculations that we used for calculating expected return. And the sixth one is that finally, we assume that all investors make the same estimates of expected returns, standard deviations of returns, and correlations between the returns for, a, for available investments. To put this in another way, we assume that investors have homogeneous expectations. So we're assuming that investors have the same expectations in the market, which is not always what necessarily the, the true. So please take note of these assumptions because they can potentially bring you these as a uh, theory questions, not in, uh, in the exam. They can ask you to either list the assumptions or they can say, is this assumption true or false? Are we on the same page? Any questions? Next, now that you have been able to determine the expected return, so now that we've been able to determine the expected return, we now need to find out exactly how do we determine the alpha, which is basically the excess returns. So from the information that they give us, if you check on example 1.2, on example 1.2, they say, uh, they give us that information. They say, consider a portfolio with a beta of 0 0.6, when the risk rate of return is uh, 4%, when the return in the market is 20%, the expected return of the portfolio is given as, right? So we have already seen this before. The risk rate of return plus beta multiplied by, in brackets, market return minus risk rate of return, it will give us an expected return of 13.6%. Now they say, when the return in the market is 10%, what do we see? If the return in the market is 10%, remember initially it was 20%, when the return in the market is 10%, it would mean your expected return would be zero point, uh, risk rate of return plus beta in brackets, the, mark, the new market return minus risk rate of return. So to give you an expected return of 0 0.76. So here they say, which is basically 7.6%. So when the return from the market is minus 10%, the expected return from the portfolio would be equal to risk rate of return plus beta in brackets, the negative market return minus risk of return, which is equal to minus 0 0.044, which is minus 4.4%. So this relationship between the expected return and the, uh, on the portfolio and the return in the market is given in figure 1.6. Uh, so they give us that relationship in figure 1.6, which is basically this relationship that we see there. So when the, uh, they are basically saying that when they uh, market return is increasing. We are expecting mm -hmm. the expected return of the portfolio to increase. But if the market return decreases, we are also expecting the expected return of the portfolio what? Mm -hmm. to decrease as well. Please put your mic microphones on mute. So, based on this, so based on this, they are basically showing you that relationship in the uh, on this um, on that graph that we looked at, so figure one point six. So here, based on this relationship, where we say suppose that the actual return in the portfolio is greater than the expected return. So if the actual return in the portfolio is greater than the expected return, they say the portfolio manager has produced a superior return from the amount of systematic risk being taken. So the, ex the extra return is what we refer to as alpha, where your alpha is given as the return, the actual return of the portfolio minus the expected return. So let me just show you how they break down that formula and how it uh, comes out to being that. 
So if your actual return is greater than the expected return, it would mean we are saying your alpha is equal to return in the, on the, the actual return of the portfolio minus expected return. So it's the return on the portfolio minus expected return. And this is the same as saying the return of the, the alpha is equal to the return of the portfolio minus, how do we get the expected return? The expected return is equal to risk rate of return plus beta market return minus risk-free rate of return. Now, if you expand this bracket, it would mean your alpha would be equal to the return of the portfolio minus in the minus there gives you a minus risk-free rate of return, right? And the minus and the uh, positive here gives you minus beta in bracket. Okay. It will give you minus beta in brackets, market return minus risk-free rate of return, which is something like this. So that's basically how the equation comes from being like that to something like this as well. Are we on the same page? So here they say, this is commonly referred to as the alpha created by the portfolio manager, which is basically, so your alpha created by the portfolio manager is basically the excess returns. So it's basically how we get the excess returns. So if they say excess return or they say the alpha, you should know they're talking about one and the same thing. So they give us example 1.3 and on example 1.3, they give us that information. Uh, can you quickly read through the information that we're given and we go through together? So we're given the beta of 0 0.8, risk free rate of 5%, market return of uh, 7%. Uh, the portfolio manager's return is 9%, which is the actual return of the portfolio. And based on this, they ask us to calculate the alpha, right? So our alpha is given as, as a decimal, your risk, uh, return of the portfolio of 0 0.09 minus the risk of return, which is given as a decimal of uh, 0 0.05 minus the beta, which is given as 0 0.8 in brackets, market return, which is given as 7%, so it's 0 0.07 minus risk rate of return of 0 0.05. So given this information, would you be able to calculate the alpha or the excess return and multiply that by 100 to make it a percentage? How much would be the alpha? So how much would you get as the value of alpha? You get a figure of 0 0.024. And if you multiply that by 100, it will give you 2.4%. Are we getting the same amount? For exam purposes, sometimes they give you the value of alpha 
and they can give you they can give you the value of alpha then they can either ask you to calculate the market return if it's the missing one or they can ask you to determine the result of return if it's the missing one or they can ask you to calculate the beta or even the market return if it's the missing one as well which means that you should also know that you can be able asked to do a mathematical manipulation of this equation. So please be prepared for that as well in the exam. So they can either ask you to solve for this, or they can either ask you to solve for this, or they can ask you to solve for this, or they can ask you to solve for this as well, where you are now playing around with this equation, what, by doing what? Mathematical manipulations as well. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anyone lost? Moving on, uh, moving on, section 1.4 looks at the arbitrage pricing theory. So it's another theory that is also used in determining the expected return as well. So here they say, uh, looking at the arbitrage pricing theory, they say the arbitrage pricing theory can be viewed as an extension of the capital asset pricing model in the, uh, please put your microphones on mute. Uh, please put your microphones on mute. So with the arbitrage pricing theory, they say in arbitrage pricing theory, the return depends on several factors. These factors might involve variables such as the gross national product, the domestic interest rate, and the inflation rate. So by exploring ways in which the investors can form portfolios that eliminate uh, exposure to the factors, arbitrage pricing theory shows that the expected return from an investment is linearly dependent on the factors as well. So when you look at the arbitrage pricing theory, we are basically saying it's an extension to the capital asset pricing model, mainly because we're saying with the capital asset pricing model, we're saying that our expected return was given as the result of return plus beta, market return minus risk rate of return. So we are basically saying that the, oh, the only risk factor that we're taking into account was the beta, which is the systematic risk, which is basically dependent, going to be multiplied by what? The difference between the market return and the risk of return. So the arbitrage pricing theory also say, goes further to say, when you're covering the expected return, you're going to be adding the effect of other factors, which means, you are going to be adding the effect of other factors. Please put your microphone on mute. So you are going to be adding the effect of other factors, which basically means that apart from taking into account the beta as one factor, you are going to be taking into account the effect of other factors as well, where each factor is going to be multiplied by the risk, pre, uh, the, um, the risk premium. So each factor, is going to be multiplied by its what? Risk premium. So risk premium as well, which means factor two is going to be multiplied by its risk premium plus factor three is also going to be multiplied by its what? Risk premium until you get to account for all the factors then. So this is basically how you come about with an expected return using the arbitrage pricing theory. So when there is basically an extension of the capital asset pricing model because we are not only taking into account the risk premium, uh, the risk factor, which is the beta multiplied by its risk premium, which is the what? Market risk premium in this case. Are we on the same page? Any questions? Anyone lost? Now, on unit or section 1.5, uh, on section 1.5, we also look at uh, risk versus return for companies. So we look at the risk versus return for companies. And here they say, we now move on to consider the trade-off between risk and return made by a company. How should a company decide whether the expected return on a new investment project is sufficient compensation for its risks? Then if you go on to the third paragraph under that section, they say, the argument just given suggests that non-systematic risks should be considered when accepting or rejecting decisions on new projects is taken. So in practice, companies are concerned about non-systematic risk as well as systematic risk. 
So please take note of this as a potential theory question. So we're basically saying investors, because they're having a, we're assuming that investors are fully diversified. The assumption is for individual investors, the risk that they're going to be taking into account would be systematic risk only. But for companies, we're basically saying that for companies, they need to take both into account the systematic and unsystematic risk as well. In what? Making the accept or reject decision as well. Are we on the same page? Because remember, these are potential theory questions that you can expect to be asked in the exam. So please make sure that you talk, take note of them. Next, we look at the effect of bankruptcy costs, right? Remember, we know that the more we borrow money, the higher the chance of the company being declared what bankrupt because they're not able to, what, to meet their obligations as well. So to highlight the effect of bankruptcy costs, we just go through a, 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 a business step snapshot, which basically highlights the effects of bankruptcy costs as well. So here they say, they look at the hidden costs of bankruptcy. And here they say, several years ago, a company had a market capitalization of 2 billion and 500 million in debt. The CEO decided to acquire a company in a related industry for 1 billion in cash. The cash was raised using a mixture of bank, debt, and bond issues. So the price paid for the company was justified on the basis of potential synergies, but key threats to the profitability of the company were overlooked. So many of the anticipated synergies were not realized. And furthermore, the company that was acquired was not profitable and proved to be a cash drain on the parent company. So after three years, the CEO resigned. The new CEO sold the acquisition for 100 million. Remember, they spent a billion and now they're selling it for 100 million, which is 10% of the price paid, and announced that the company would focus on its original core business. However, by then, the company um, wa was highly leveraged because remember, they had borrowed money to, what, to, to be able to finance this particular what, acquisition. So a temporary economic downturn made it impossible for the company to service its debt and it declared bankruptcy. So the offices of the company were soon filled with accountants and lawyers representing the interests of the various parties. So these people directly or indirectly billed the company about 10 million per month in fees. So the company lost sales that you'd normally have made because nobody wants to do business with a bankrupt company. And key senior executives left the company experienced a dramatic reduction in its market share. So after two years and three reorganization attempts, an agreement was reached among the various parties and a new company with market capitalization of 700,000 was incorporated to continue the remaining profitable parts of the business. So the shares of the, company, of the new company were entirely owned by the banks and the bondholders. So the shareholders got nothing. So this is basically a typical example which shows the hidden costs of bankruptcy because as we can see, they lost out on the investment that they ended up what having to sell. And at the same time, they had an issue where now from the, uh, they had to pay uh, uh, the lawyers and all these other people who had to help them what restructure the business as well. And at the end of the day, the, in, in a company that was uh, having a market capitalization of 2 billion ended up only being worth what? 700,000 as well. So are we on the same page when it comes to the issue of bankruptcy costs? So at the end of the day, when a company is declared bankrupt, everyone loses. The shareholders, they lose out. And the lenders as well, they also lose out because they're not able to what? In most cases, they're not able to fully realize the amount of money that they've got that they invested in the company as well. So here they say, when expected bankruptcy costs are taken into account, projects that have a high total system, uh, systematic plus non-systematic risk are liable to be rejected as unacceptable. 
So this explains why like companies to limit that. Uh, this explains why investors like companies to limit the overall amount of risk they check and reward companies that manage risk so that they meet earnings forecast as well. Are we on the same page so far? Any questions? Now, when you look at financial institutions, they say one can argue about how important bankruptcy costs are for the decision making of a non-financial uh, company, but they are, there can be no question that it is crucially important for a financial institution to, uh, such as a bank to keep its profitability, uh, probability of bankruptcy very low. So large banks rely on household de uh, wholesale deposits and instruments such as commercial paper for their funding. And because of this, they cannot afford to have what to be finding themselves in what facing bankruptcy. If you look at the case of, for example, the VBS bank as well. Next, we also look at regulation. And here they say, even if in spite of the arguments we have just given, the manager of a bank want to take huge risks, they would not be allowed to do so. Unlike other companies, many financial institutions are heavily regulated. So governments throughout the world want a stable financial sector. So it is important that companies and private individuals have confidence in the banks and insurance companies when they transact business. So the regulations are designed to ensure that the probability of a large bank or an insurance company uh, expected uh, experiencing grave, uh, severe financial difficulties is long. So the bailouts of the financial institutions in 2008 during the subprime crisis illustrate the reluctance of governments to let large financial institutions fail. So regulated financial institutions are forced to consider total risk. That's why you see that um, when you look at regulation, we're going to be looking at it uh, later on in chapter 15 and 16, where we are going to be looking at uh, the Basel Accord and also the Solvency Act as well, where the Basel Accord is the one relevant for uh, banks and the Solvency Act is the one for insurance companies as well. Can you move on to section 1.6? So in section 1.6, we look at risk management by financial institutions. And yet they say, there are two broad risk management strategies open to financial institutions. One approach is to identify risk one by one and handle each one separately. So this is sometimes referred to as risk decomposition. The other is to reduce risk by being well diversified. So this is sometimes referred to as risk aggregation. So both approaches are typically used by financial institutions. So please, Take note of this because this is a potential theory question in the exam. So this is a potential theory question in the exam. So please make sure that you take note of this uh, section as well. On section 1.7, we also look at credit ratings. And when we look at credit ratings, they say, Credit rating agencies provide information that is widely used by financial market participants for management of credit risk. So a credit rating is a measure of the credit quality of debt instruments, such as a bond. However, the rating of a corporate or sovereign bond is often assumed to be an attribute of the bond issuer, uh, of the bond issuer rather than the bond itself. So thus, if the bonds issued by a company they have a rating of triple A, the company is often referred to as having a rating of what? Of triple A as well. So please just make sure that you don't take note of this, but don't worry much about the different ratings which are used by the different what? Rating agencies as well. Don't worry much about that. I don't see that as something that is uh, examinable. So on this note, this is where Chapter one comes to an end, which is also learning unit one. Are there any questions? <laughs>
Any questions? So please take note of what we have covered so far when we looked at um, the theory sections that I've uh, emphasized to say, please take note of this as potential theory questions. Very, very important. Also, please take note of this relationship where we looked at the capital asset pricing model. We also looked at the calculation of alpha and we also looked to see exactly how does the alpha relate to the, uh, the actual return of the portfolio and the capital asset pricing model as well. And remember, if you, remember, if you look at this particular formula, they can potentially ask you to manipulate this formula to get one of the missing. They can give you the alpha, then they ask you to calculate this, or they can ask you to calculate this, or they can ask you to calculate this, or they can ask you to calculate this as well. So you need to know the mathematical manipulation in case they give you this in the exam as well. Then remember the breakdown of the capital asset price model as well, where we also looked at the breakdown of that calculation of the beta and the different ways that you can also be able to look at the calculation of the beta as well. Very, very important. So are there any questions on what we did in chapter one? Are there any questions on what we covered in chapter one? All right, so can we move on to learning unit two? So can you move on to learning unit two?